Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, and the great moment has arrived. We're going to be talking about, oh, God, can I pick it up? Yes, here it is, the Eugene Ormandy box, the mono-only box, 120 CDs worth of it. Unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable, and it's going to be so much fun, but this is such a project that I have to hold it here. Oh, this has been something the collectors have been waiting for for such a long time. And it really does fill in an important bit of discographic history. Because everybody who enjoyed Ormandy in stereo knew that there was this vast legacy of mono stuff that was out of print forever. And so the opportunity to hear it again, some private sort of quasi-pirated people have been issuing some of it, which is where, frankly, I heard a lot of it. But, you know, this is really an opportunity to get back in touch with a tremendous discographic legacy, a tremendous legacy that we only heard sort of the tail end of, most of us anyway. In fact, most of the people, I think probably almost all the people who got these mono recordings when they were new, which, I mean, this ends in 1958, they were probably dead by now. There aren't many of them left. So we have to treat this as something something new, something never heard before. And for that reason, I'm going to break this up into two talks. One of them, the second one, the one coming next, is going to be about the box, specifically like disc by disc or composer by composer, more likely. However, let me put this down. We're going to start with how not to talk about this box. Because one of you pointed out to me, and I went and had a look, that Richard Osborne in Gramophone has already published his review of this box, and I read it, and it was so atrocious, such a criminal abdication, abd abdication, a criminal abdication of critical responsibility, that I just felt that we had to start by having a little chat about how not to review the 120 disc Ormandy box. So I'm gonna read Osborne's review, all of Osborne's review. It's actually, you know, not that long, about a dozen paragraphs or so. And we're gonna talk about why it is such an atrocious and completely irresponsible and ridiculous way to look at this particular recorded legacy. It has its bits, it has its observations, which are valid, and it is full of bullshit. So let us, without further ado, do part one of the Ormandy legacy and how not to review it. So here we go. <clears throat> Osborne writes as follows. This collection is certainly a colorful affair, an old curiosity shop of a box among whose 120 CDs selling for about 287 pounds are 179 recordings new to CD and no fewer than 139 receiving their first authorized release. Now that to me sounds like a good thing. That doesn't sound like the colorful affair and old curiosity shop, as if it has no validity for modern listeners, which is sort of what he's suggesting. You know, it's one of those, one of those, you know, well, yeah, you know what I mean. I don't have to, I don't have to interpret it. It's obvious. So he says, for inquiring minds, tired of receiving third-hand opinions about Ormandy's conducting, there will be much to explore. Indeed, there will. The set's subtitle is The Columbia Legacy, though a paper strip pasted to the box protective shrink wrap reveals that these are mono recordings from the years 1944 to 1958. Nothing from the final stereo decade of the orchestra's 24-year 24 24 relationship with Columbia, because of course all of that has been largely available, remains largely available, and indeed has recently been reissued in a bunch of budget boxes devoted to Strauss and Tchaikovsky and Mozart and I mean, all kinds of you know, the stuff is out there. I mean, it would be nice to have it all in a box, reissued and remastered and redone and whatever, but that's why. <laughs> because Ormandy has been so popular and so well-known and so highly respected that most of his stereo legacy has never been out of print. And that's a fact, which I think 
Mr. Osborne would have done well to acknowledge. But no, let us go back to the old curiosity shop. Now comes the fairy tale. Now, this is, this is fascinating because we now get a couple paragraphs of completely useless information that has nothing to do with anything. It's kind of like a Michener novel. You know, the Mitchell novels, you know, they start with like the creation of the universe and, 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 you know, the primeval mass coalesces and dinosaurs stomp around and cavemen grab women by the hair and drag them into their caves. And then civilization gradually arises and cuneiform starts. And then when it's all done, you're in Los Angeles and it's 1962. But, you know, that's the way Michener always begins with the creation of the universe. So, so does Osborne. And this is, you know, when you have to be concise. Here we go. A historic label dating back to Edison's time, Columbia had been subsumed by media conglomerate CBS in 1938. Don't we need to know this? Looking to be top dog there rather than a bit player with RCA Victor, the Philadelphians had jumped ship in 1944. As we can hear, the relationship began well, thanks in part to Columbia's securing the services of the vastly experienced former head of A&R at Victor, Charles O'Connell, a man who worked closely with Stokowski, Toscanini, whom he much disliked, and a 35-year-old Hungarian-born firebrand in Minnesota, Eugene Ormandy. Fine, okay, now we're, we we're getting to Ormandy. We're now at Ormandy, but only that's the only mention of Ormandy. After O'Connell's departure in 1948, things began to go downhill. Lack of knowledge in dealing with Philadelphia's acoustically challenging halls, time-pressured recording sessions, and slapdash editing appeared to have been one of this one set of problems. Another was the kind of repertory CBS thought it commercially prudent to record in Philadelphia. Popular classics and operatic arrangements, alongside the occasional gesture towards 20th century American music, brilliantly articulated performances of William Schumann, less sympathetic ones of the more classically inclined Walter Piston, and a certain amount of locally directed material. Now, the truth of that, obviously, is in the box. And if we look in the box, let's just see, let us just see what passes for, wait a minute, let's see what this is, popular classics and operatic arrangements alongside the occasional gesture towards 20th century American music. Okay. All right. So here is the box. If we look at, I'm just going to pull out the first batch of discs, okay? Because I want to be able to tell you quite easily, here they are. Let's see, one, two, oh, here's the first 10. I'm taking out the first 10 discs, and let's see what they did that was so, you know, inappropriate. All right, we start with, let's see, disc one. Lalo, Symphony Espanol with Nathan Milstein. Not too shabby. Bard and Palopsi and Dances. Uh, a bit of Respighi and short pieces. Yes, popular classics. The Gluck, Dance of the Blessed Spirits, and the Soupe, uh, Poet and Peasant Overture. All righty. Disc two, Harl MacDonald. There you go, the American music, My Country at War with the Philadelphia Orchestra. And let's see, what is this? And then Paul White's Sea Chanty and Howard Hansen, the Serenade for Flute, Harp, and String Orchestra and Kent Kennan, Night Soliloquy. So there you go, some more American music. Ah, Beethoven's Seventh, just a popular classic of no possible relevance. Actually, there may be, there's more than that on here, I think, probably. But I'm just going by these original jacket things. They don't always tell you what's, you know, actually on the disc. You have to look at the book for that, but we're just going to go through it. Brahms Piano Concerto number two with Rudolf Serkin. A Brahms Violin Concerto with Joseph Segetti. Popular classics of no particular significance. And what is this thing here? Six dances. I wonder what's on this disc. That's very interesting. You know, I'm actually going to look at the book and find out because I'm really curious to see what's on disc number four. Here it is, wait a minute, because this is a very nice booklet, and it tells us exactly what we get. Let's see, there's the Brahms. Okay, six dances. Ah, the Russian Sailor's Dance. Oh, the Fernandez Batuque, that's not conducted by Ormandy. Uh, the Dance of the Comedians by Smedna, the Vorsic Slavonic Dance, Brahms, Hungarian Dance number five. And then we get, oh, there's a whole pile of, of additional stuff now. Johann Strauss the second, and Debussy's The Demoiselle Elue. Well, there you go. He mentions that, Osborne, to his credit. I will say that. And let us continue now. Let's see. We had six dances. And then there's Debussy Nocturnes. 
only two of them, and uh, because no one did the sirens in those days, or speaking pines of Rome, the Dvorak Cello Concerto with Pieta Gorski, uh, then the New World Symphony, the Franck D minor, and those are your first 10 discs. Who, who else had that range of stuff? I mean, really, I, this, is, this is the set of problems that started in 1948, I, I I don't I mean the first recording here. Um, let me see what the date of this is. I think it was actually later than that. All right. Well, we don't have to go into it. The point I want to make, and you can see very very clearly, is that is that what he says there is is simply not borne out by the musical facts, and he knows that, and because he knows that, he has to deal with it, and he does, and he deals with it in a way which is really very intellectually dishonest, as you will see in a moment. So there you go. So now let's continue with Mr. Osborne's review. Now that we know that the way that he describes what the Columbia was doing with the Philadelphia Orchestra is complete folderol and hooey. Yes, he continues. Blessed with the young orchestra and a revered music academy, the Curtis Institute, Philadelphia offered rich pickings, not least from among the many world-renowned musicians who taught at the Institute, the likes of Rudolf Serkin and Gregor Piatigorsky, heard here at a superb and at the time unpublished account of Dvorak's cello concerto. There were also local composers, such as Richard Yardumian and orchestra manager Harl MacDonald, to whom Ormandy was understandably loyal. Yes. The collection also reminds us of some exceptional, though nowadays little remembered, Philadelphians. Soprano Margaret Harshaw, for instance, Helen Traubel, Traubel's successor at the Met, and a notably human Brunhilde under Rudolf Kempf at Covent Garden in 1954, which is sort of irrelevant because <laughs> she's not in the box for Rudolf Kempf. Rudolf Kempe, 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 heard here in the immolation scene from Wagner's Guter Dameron. And now we need to keep track of something. I have a pad and a pen. Let us talk about how many discs of this 120 Mr. Uh, Osborne here actually discusses. So what have we got here? Let's take a look and see what we've got in real life. We have the Dvorak Cello Concerto. All right, let's call that a disc. We'll give him credit, so I'll mark it down. That's number one. Now, he did do pieces by Artemian and MacDonald, but there's no evidence here that that um, Mr. Osborne actually listened to them. And I'm talking about where he says something about the performance, where he actually listened to him. Margaret Harshaw, let's assume she, he listened to her. That's maybe, I mean, that's a third of a disc. So we have to wait to get more before we can add a disc. So, so far, we're, we're now one, two, three, four, five, six, six or seven paragraphs into it. And uh, so far, he's talked about one recording, the Dvorak Cello Concerto, out of 120. Let us continue. Sony's introductory essay, headlined Creator, Creator and Creation, perpetuates the myth, get this, encouraged by Ormandy that it was he who created the modern Philadelphia Orchestra. In reality, it was an, or it was an orchestra he inherited and largely let be. No need in conservative Philadelphia to remake and renew, as Zell would do in Cleveland or Carrion and Berlin. Now this, first of all, is a lie, number one. And number two, it's really a scurrilous insinuation because, because the idea is, of course, that a great conductor is only one who renews. And that is crap. That is absolute crap. Ormandy got a great orchestra, let's admit, because Tchaikovsky was there since 1912. And Ormandy took over in 19, what was it, 44, 45, somewhere in there. And he maintained the orchestra. Orchestras do not maintain themselves. Orchestras do not stay great spontaneously. They need to be kept great. And they are kept great, especially in this period when musicians were completely at the mercy at the beck and call of the music director, and that's the person who kept the orchestra great. So Ormandy deserves credit, not just for creating the Philadelphia sound or maintaining the Philadelphia sound, but for, but for keeping the orchestra among the world's great orchestras for the entire period that he was there, period. And that's an achievement. And it is disgraceful to diminish that achievement because he was not Zell or he was not Carrion. Carrion did it because 
he was very different from Fort Vengler. Zell had a new orchestra. He was given carte blanche to do whatever he wanted. Ormandy inherited a great orchestra. And not only did he maintain it, but his sonic predilections were quite similar to those of Stokowski. He was a chord guy. He praised and valued a rich sound. He had a particular idea of sonority. It was quite similar to the music director who came previously. Ormandy particularly chose Muti to succeed him because his sonic predilections were quite different. And that's a whole different kettle of beans, a whole different way of proceeding. But there is nothing wrong with maintaining a fabulous tradition and making sure that it never descended one whit below the exalted level at which one inherited it. So give the guy some credit, but you see where this is going. You see where this is going with Mr. Osborne. It's going to be one of those damning with faint praise pieces. And so it turns out, and you have to remember, Osborne has a bit of a, a, an agenda. Why? Because Osborne is a carrion whore. That's his life. He wrote the book on Carrion. He spent most of his major career as a gramophone critter, critter, critter. I like critter, critic, as an apologist for Herbert von Carrion. And of course, Carrion's great competition on the other side of the Atlantic, in a sense, was Ormandy. And Ormandy was a vastly more interesting conductor than Carrion was. He had a much wider range of repertoire, a much greater range of interest, a much more considerable devotion to contemporary music. And, you know, if it depends on how you judge these people, as you may understand. And he had an orchestra that was every bit as good as the Berlin Philharmonic. But of course, it never got as much cred in Europe because it was American. And, by the way, the Berlin Philharmonic never got as much cred over here because we had Philadelphia. I mean, it worked both ways. So but we, we need to understand in an objective sense where Mr. Osborne is coming from. So he ends with Carrion in Berlin, who was a remake and renewer, and Ormandy was not. I don't think that was really fair. So... <clears throat> The orchestra contains some wonderful players. One thinks of the long-serving principal, Flute, William, uh, Flute, Principal Flute. His name was not Flute. The long-serving principal, Flute, William Kincaid, or cellist Lauren Monroe, who's playing of the death of Quixote in a 1955 recording of the Richard Strauss tone poem, had me hearing the epilogue twice over. Okay, that's disc number two he's listened to. He heard it twice over. Equally, there are others, such as oboist Marcel Tabuteau, who joined in 19... 19- 15 and left in 1954, who might best be described as an acquired taste. There's actually a huge book on the guy about, well, an autobiography by Tabuto. He was a famous, famous oboist, legendary oboist. Um, so he was an acquired taste. This coming from the land of snake charmer oboes, because nothing was more snaky and goat-like than British oboes up through the 1970s. Just listen to any of Clemper's Philharmonia recordings, and you hear, <laughs> you do know what I mean. Okay. Um, and he writes, not unlike those Philadelphia horns in what, on record at least, is their strangely occluded sound. They sound fine to me. Anyway, the playing at best can be spectacular. The 1953 recording of Mussorgsky's pictures at an exhibition is the perfect catwalk for such gifted instrumentalists. Notice how the instrumentalists get the credit, never mentioning the conductor. No, 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 we mustn't give Ormandy any credit, must we? As is Stravinsky's right, with Ormandy's 1955 recording every bit as thrilling as the Stokowski that preceded it or the Muti that followed. So there you go. Let's just say that's another disc because the two of them together make one disc. So that's three that we've heard. It's in the symphonic repertoire. Ah, the symphonic repertoire. The things become problematic. Unlike fellow emigres from Austria-Hungary, Reiner, Zell, Antal Dorati, Ormandy had no first-hand concert or opera house training. Well, that's not true. That's completely not true. I mean, Ormandy trained at the Budapest, the Royal Academy in Budapest, which became the Franz Liszt Academy. You know, he was a, he was a student of Jeno Hubai. I mean, he was the same, same people who trained Reiner 
<laughs> and and Schulte and Zalandarati. I mean, all those people that were the Kodai and Doknati, they were all there. Ormandy was there then. It was with the same crew. And Osborne continues, a gifted violinist with a fine ear and a photographic memory, he found himself stranded in New York in the winter of 1921-22 during an ill-advised solo tour. He quickly landed a position in the 80-piece orchestra of a Manhattan movie palace from where he would be catapulted into the orchestral big time on the hunch of America's musical kingmaker, kingmaker Arthur Judson. Well, isn't that an interesting bit of bullshit? First of all, Ormandy not only wound up in the orchestra, which was an 80-piece film orchestra, he was the concert master of that orchestra. And playing in a film orchestra in a movie house was a fabulous musical experience. It doesn't mean, A, that Ormandy had no concert experience before he got to America. He was only in his 20s then, granted, but he played in that orchestra. And then he took over the Minneapolis Symphony. Don't forget, for quite a few years, where he acquired an enormous concert repertoire and made premier recordings of Bruckner 7th and Mahler 2. I mean, you know, the guy's experience before he got to Philadelphia was huge, absolutely huge. And here is, here is... Osborne trying to diminish it at every turn, and it continues. Here we go. It's interesting to recall that Ormandy's first appearance in gramophone has him conducting the Eugene Ormandy Orchestra in waltzes from the films Married in Hollywood and The Gold Diggers of Broadway. This barely a year before Judson invited him to stand in for Toscanini in a series of concerts in Philadelphia. Gene, there's a vacancy in Philadelphia, but it could be suicide. Well, does that say that Ormandy lacked experience? Or did it say that A, he was musically enormously gifted, B, had incredible experience and confidence, and C, was such a, a, a conductorial genius that they decided to give him a break as a conductor, that he became a conductor. But he skips. Notice he's, he's eliminating the entire prior to Philadelphia period where Ormandy was a conductor of a real orchestra making lots of records. I mean, come on, Osborne. It's, it's, it's just so, so smarmy. It's so smarmy. Ugh. Okay, here we go. As Ormandy's 1944-45 recordings of Beethoven's Seventh, Dvorak's New World, and César Franck amply demonstrate, okay... That's one, two, three more discs. There we go. Wait a minute. One, two, three, four, uh, five, six, seven. We're up to seven. Okay. As those recordings amply demonstrate, he was a skilled assimilator. He was an assimilator, well able to direct such pieces with vitality and rigor after the manner of his god Toscanini. Well, I mean, listen to those recordings yourself. They don't sound anything like Toscanini. If you think they sound like Toscanini, Osborne, you're on drugs and your hearing needs adjustment. He's also difficult to pigeonhole. Well, is that a bad thing? Maybe he just isn't someone who's predictable in the way you like them to be predictable, Mr. Osborne. It's, ugh. it's possible to despair of his ineffectual and over-cosseted Brahms conducting. Where? I don't know where that is. Only to be struck dumb by a 1950 recording of the First Symphony, whose very directness puts to shame the doubts and insecurities of many a more admired Brahmsian. Oh, well, okay. So his Brahms is terrific. <laughs> there you go. I mean, it really is, actually. His Brahms was always terrific. He's a very good Brahms conductor. Period. And why? what's the harm in saying so? Why do you have to praise this one recording of Brahms first, while at the same time telling us that he was worthless in Brahms? I mean, what, what is that? What is the point? What does this tell us as listeners to think how we should think of, of Ormandy or other performances? But more to the point, more to the point, why, why can't you just come out and explain what you hear? I mean, say what you hear without trying to create some wider judgment on the man. I mean, just, just talk about what it sounds like. It's all you have to do. Nevertheless, Okay, here we go. He was nonetheless an unpredictable musician. Oh, yes, as if Carion was predictable. Everybody is predictable. Predictability is good. Reviewing a Mozart concerto recording made with Rudolf Circuit in 1951, Andrew Porter complained, ah, now, 
of poor accompaniment, rhythm not firmly set, the phrasing of the second subjects sentimentalized, a tendency to push on and push on in instrumental ritornellos, an absurdly fast tempo in the finale. Not that this was always the case. His 1954 recording of Beethoven's early B-flat concerto with circuit is a minor classic. Such inconsisten- inconsistencies baffle. And what baffles me is the fact that there is no evidence from that particular paragraph that Mr. Osborne has listened anew to the recordings in question. And so they don't count as actual listening. It's fascinating to hear his account of Chopin's E minor concerto with fellow Hungarian Georgi Sándor. Their 1946 world premiere recording of Bartók's third concerto is nothing special. The music as yet poorly assimilated by both men, but the Chopin is superb, at least in the way Ormandy shapes Chopin's free recitatives in a way that both accommodates his soloist and keeps a firm grip on the moments of harmonic change. All right, aside from the, I mean, the bullshit there, let's just give that credit for another recording listened to um, because the Chopin and the Bartok fit on a disc. And I have to say, I have to say, you know, the old idea that, you know, Ormandy is, you know, an accompanist, not a real conductor, just an accompanist, right? Really just an accompanist. Okay. Then he continues, that's real conducting. Yeah, real conducting. Yet at other times, he could be both careless and pointlessly interventionist. There's a 1953 recording of the Romeo and Juliet Overture in which he willfully alters Tchaikovsky's phrasing of the muted string's response to the first statement of the love theme, yet doesn't notice or isn't bothered by the fact that at the recapitulation, his wind section phrases the music exactly as Tchaikovsky suggests. Yeah, that's called conducting. That's interpreting. It actually sounds wonderful, by the way. I listened to it. And, you know, it really sounds great the way Ormandy does it. He writes, it's a dreadful performance. With Tchaikovsky's relatively discreet use of cymbal clashes in the fight scene ruthlessly overridden. Tchaikovsky? Discreet? In the fight music? What are you, on drugs? Of course. Yeah, Ormandy adds cymbal crashes. You know how this fight begins? It begins, bum, ba da dum, bum, ba And then when it comes back, it's bum, ba da 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 I know, I've played it. Well, Ormandy adds the cymbals at the beginning when it first comes up. But then again, remember, many, many, many performers played with Tchaikovsky, especially Russian conductors. Russian conductors always play with Tchaikovsky. Look at what they do to the Manfred Symphony or the cut, the cuts that they take in the finale of the fifth, which Ormandy never did, by the way. I mean, you have Van Kempen doing it with the Berlin Philharmonic, and where's Osborne bitching about that, eh? Yeah, Ormandy was an interventionist, as was Stokowski. Ormandy tinkered with scoring. He really tinkered with percussion parts. So did Stokowski. That was the school, their interpretive idea. That's what they did. Oh, so by the way, did Carrion. Carrion futzed around with things all the time too. So, you know, I mean, when people start saying things like that, you know, it's not a bad performance. It's a very good performance. And I mean, the way he just, Tchaikovsky's discreet use of cymbal clashes in the fight scene. Oh my God, I can't believe it. Such rewritings were not uncommon at the time. Right! The fact remains, though, Ormandy was a musician of strong passions and uncertain taste. Oh, screw you, Osborne. How elevated is your taste? Please. Like he's, he's the, the, the guardian of taste. Like Carrion's heavy-duty, all-purpose, totally thick vibrato, not a woodwind to be seen, was tasteful. Right, yeah, sure, okay, if that's how we're going to define taste, then his Stokowski-style Bach orchestral transcriptions have to be heard to be believed. Indeed, they do. They're absolutely wonderful. For those who really know and love Bach, the spectacle is one to make the angels weep, wrote the normally reserved Alec Robertson in these columns in May 1949. Who gives a shit what Alec Robertson thought in 1949? What matters is what today's listeners will experience and have an opportunity to hear if they acquire this set. What matters is whether or not these performances are musically rewarding to us today. I would suggest 
that they are, or at the very least, that people need to be apprised and make up their own minds. Ormandy's Bach was like Stokowski's. It was like everybody else's Stokowski's. It was like Respighi's and Schoenberg's and everybody reorchestrated Bach. Do you think Schoenberg's Saint Anne Prelude and Fugue is an ode to musical taste? I mean, do you really? Or that, or that Elgar's, Elgar's what, Prelude and Fugue in C minor, whatever that thing is, with that insane brass writing, is, is an apotheosis of musical taste? I mean, what is Osborne's point? Simply to demean Ormandy. I mean, that's, that's what he's doing. And, you know, I'm not always a fan of Ormandy, but, you know, be fair, be honest. Okay, Nora was A.R. It's Alec Robertson, right? Wasn't that the guy who we don't care about from 1949? Yeah, well, whoever the hell it was. A.R. in Grandpa, much enamored of a batch of Strauss recordings, Johann and Ricard, that was also under review. Ormandy could be terrific in the right in the in the kind of light music he had come to know and play in New York. You mean he had to come to New York before he knew Strauss? I mean, or there was something in New York he learned there that he didn't know before? What was that? I wonder. I have no idea. There's a superb disc here of music by that great benefactor of American music and friend of Dvorak, Victor Herbert. Yes, there is. All right, wait, there's another disc that was actually listened to. Okay. I think, isn't that where we are? Yeah, I'm just making sure, because that Romeo and Juliet, which is the last thing he, he listened to, that's only 20 minutes long, so that doesn't count. as <laughs> a whole disc listened to. Um, but Ormandy's conducting of the music of the Strauss family tends to be brittle and hard-driven. As for his only complete opera recording, a 1950 English-language version of Deflator Mouse, here the carelessness of the conducting beggar's belief. Yeah. I've never been a fan of that Flater Mouse, although it has a great cast, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So let's let's give him credit for hearing Strauss, and the Flater Mouse is two discs, so let's put down two right there. So there we are. We're up to 12, 12 out of 120. That's, that's, that's let's see, 12? Yeah, it's 10%. We're getting there. Okay, during his year, early years with Columbia, Ormandy, or perhaps O'Connell, programmed some interesting modern rarities. Debussy's Rossetti-inspired gem, the Demoiselle Elu, for, for instance, recorded with soprano Bidou Sayal, who had made her New York debut in this very work under Tuscanini in 1936. Again, this is just history. This is not listening. So it's just recitation. There was also an ongoing relationship with Soviet Russia. In 1944, the Philadelphians had sent bows and reeds to their beleaguered colleagues in Leningrad. Prokofiev's Alexander Nevsky is here, crudely done in English. Oh, there we go. We get another one. You listen to it. Uh, crudely done in English, but with Jenny Torell and the Great Lament, as are Ormandy's, Ormandy's pioneering Western recordings of Prokofiev's Sixth Symphony and his Valedictory Seventh, the latter especially fine. So, okay, there's another one that you may have listened to, possibly. To be fair, okay, oh, now he's going to be fair. Oh, I can't wait to hear about the fair part. Uh, Columbia's new A&R director, David Oppenheim, to be fair to Columbia's new A&R director, David Oppenheim, he was not alone, alone among international recording executives in the 1950s in shying away from Mahler, whose second symphony, Mormondia, recorded in Minneapolis in 1935. Oh, yes. He was in, in, in Minneapolis in 1935, and his 10th symphony he would later record for Columbia in the, in the Derek, Cook complete, uh, Derek Cook completion, or from Shostakovich, six of whose symphonies had been given their American premieres by the Philadelphians. The omissions are disappointing, nevertheless. What is his point? No, they didn't record them in mono. They recorded all that stuff in stereo. We don't, this is not a review of what is not in the box, and why is that disappointing? I mean, that because, because Columbia's A&R people weren't doing those, they weren't alone among international record executives in the 50s shying away from Mahler. Okay, so people in the 50s shied away from Mahler. So how does that, what does that have to do with Ormandy and this box? Ormandy actually was, was pretty good when it came to Mahler and he just not in this box, it's in another box. Give Ormandy credit. Ormandy did Mahler and they recorded Ormandy doing Mahler. Oh, God. Rather more baffling is the delay until 1960 of a recording of Rachmaninoff's Symphonic Dances, a work that had been written for Ormandy and the orchestra in 1940. Well, again, it's not here. And why do we care that it's not here? And how is that a bad thing that it's not here? 
Actually, when they did get around to doing it in 1960, it wasn't one of Ormandy's better performances. It's a pretty pale and uninteresting recording. But that's not the point. It's not here. Okay, then. Yet, time could be found to schedule Honegger's oratorio, Jean d'Arc, a gift, it turns out, from CBS executive Goddard Lieberson to his wife, Vera Zorina, the German-born ex-wife of George Balanchine and a former member of the Ballet Russe, who was cast, not entirely successfully, in the Ida Rubinstein role of speaker. Okay, so that's another one you may have listened to. But, you know, again, hey, here you have an interesting... A really interesting piece of unusual repertoire that Ormandy was willing to do to his credit, and here he makes it sound as though it's just it's just a there's some political reason for it, and the conductor and the performers get no credit, no credit for doing such an unusual and interesting work at that point in time. So they didn't do Mahler; they did Honegger, Jean d'Arc, or Boucher. Pretty damn good and interesting, in my opinion. The set has some intriguing fillers, with Sony's editors giving us a handful of recordings by the orchestra under conductors other than Ormandy. Bruno Walter and Beethoven's Pastoral Symphony, which is great. Beecham in a highly entertaining rendering of music from Lord Berner's Diaghilev Ballet, The Triumph of Neptune. Terrific recording. Slightly more mischievous is the inclusion of some of the original LP couplings made by artistic rivals at Columbia. Take Disc 44, where a 1952 recording of Morton Gould's Fall River Legend by the New York Philharmonic under Dimitri Metropolis, a musician Ormandy feared, and Oppenheim did his best to ignore. Again, you know, let's promote Metropolis. This is an Ormandy box. Let's, let's dis Ormandy at every opportunity is prefaced by Ormandy and the orchestra having a high old time in the Gottschalk-derived ballet Cakewalk, devised by legendary Philadelphia-born arranger Hershey K. And the last line, a flawed legacy then, but nothing if not colorful. And that, my friends, is the non-review. I'm going to give him credit for, let's say if we put in the Gottschalk and add the Tchaikovsky and the other little short things, that, that adds up to another disc. So, 120 discs. All of those paragraphs of verbiage, and Mr. Osborne listened to one, two, three, by my count, 16 discs. 16 discs. Of course, he quotes earlier gramophone reviews. Now, it's lovely that gramophone was around in the 1940s, and it's lovely that Mr. Osborne can research gramophone reviews from the 1940s and quote them for us. But quite frankly, first of all, gramophone has no special weight or authority in telling us what we should like and not like from 1940-something. These things have been remastered very carefully. You'll hear, I'll tell you, I can't hear. If you're an insider, you'll hear. And the, the bottom line is, the bottom line is, the guy didn't listen to what's in the box. He quotes his friends. He tells us fables. He hates Ormandy. Clearly, he dislikes Ormandy. He's not fair to Ormandy. He's not balanced or reasonably tries to be. You know, we get we get all the bullshit and double speak, right? He's giving us all the, all that falderall. But that this is not a review of one hundred and twenty discs, fourteen years of an extraordinary recorded legacy full of interesting stuff and cool repertoire and marvelous performances. And I will be discussing many of those. Now, let's be realistic. I want to be fair to Mr. Osborne because I've been dogging him fairly seriously. Do any of us have an opportunity to listen to these 120 discs again? I could. I haven't heard them all yet. I have sampled as much as I could. And I've listened to, I must say, honestly, a hefty, hefty chunk of them, particularly the performance I wasn't familiar with. A lot of them we know. For example, if you have the Circan box and you listen to that, you heard the Circan stuff. If you have if you have some of these other people, Pieter Gorski or some of the other soloists that we worked with, you've heard those recordings. The Zagetti Bronze Violin Concerto just came out in the Zagetti box. I happened to listen to it a couple of weeks ago. You know, so yeah, yeah. I mean, you hear these things some of them from other places, some of them because you just know them, and the others, you do have an obligation as a critic to listen to a good chunk. 
Not all of it. You don't have to. Yes, there are issues I've read about. There are issues sometimes with some of the editing, some of the things. I mean, you know, you may find a note missing or a bar edited out or some something that went wrong originally. And since they were using original tapes, you're stuck with what's on the tape rather than the original source and re-editing and going back or whatever. I, I don't know. It's very, very difficult, if not impossible, to cover 120 CDs, particularly in one review and particularly in writing as opposed to on video where I can sit here and blab endlessly as I'm doing now, for example. But the truth remains, the fact remains, in all of this, it's, it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. Two-ish paragraphs, you can talk about more than 16 discs. And you should. And you have an obligation to. You really, really do. I don't think that Mr. Osborne has done his job. I don't think he's written a fair and balanced review. I think that it really is a very, very unfortunate effort. And so in our next video, tomorrow, our next big video, there may be a couple surprises in the middle, but the next big one, I'll be doing the box. We're going to talk about the box. We're going to talk about everything that's in it on these 120 CDs. And, and you know, I, I don't know that you don't, you may not trust me more than you trust him. It doesn't make any difference. It doesn't make any difference whether you like me or you like Osborne or you trust me or you trust Osborne. We have a job to do. Our job is to listen and report to you. And that is what I propose to do. And that is what I would suggest he has not done. And this is a man who has been a reputable, very reputable critic for a very, very long time. And he really, really should know better. So shame on you, Mr. Osborne. Keep on listening, folks. The rest of the box, the real story, the truth, is yet to come. Take care. Bye-bye.